Hi everyone, welcome to Virtual Growth Conference. Um, thank you for joining at this late hour today. Um, our usual time is uh, in the afternoons, but uh, today we're doing it in the evening. Um, just wanted to thank Derek uh, for joining us today. Uh, Derek will introduce himself shortly, um, so I'll let him do that. But first, uh, I thought I'll give a bit of background to Virtual Growth Conference. Um, Virtual Growth Conference is um, built out of uh, after COVID-19 happened and when we had a lot of the startup events and not being able to be held physically. Uh, so we moved everything to online. Um, so um, we had speakers from entrepreneurs to investors uh, speak about their experience and what startups should be doing, especially during this time and after this uh, COVID-19 passes as well. Um, we run this uh, about twice a month um, just purely through webinar and also um, feel free to ask any questions uh, during a webinar and there's the q a function which you can submit your questions and do upvote other questions uh, from other people if you want to get answers to those um, we have a few sponsors for this event uh, including startup grind uh, sensen um, singapore global network uh, sorry startup grind sensen is a startup network based out of Sensen. Uh, so if you're looking for any help uh, in understanding Sensen startup scene, please do look for them. Um, we also have Singapore Global Network, which is a, um, a government agency from Singapore, which promotes uh, friends of Singapore as well as uh, Singaporeans to come and see Singapore, as well as uh, understand what Singapore has to offer, especially now. Um, in the startup scene, uh, uh, Singapore is really doing things there that are quite amazing. Um, and also, um, as well, Tusk Park, uh, Hong Kong, uh, part of Tsinghua University, um, Accelerator. Uh, so they have been helping us as well. Uh, and if you're looking for help, uh, you can approach them. So thank you very much uh, for the sponsors. And uh, I thought I'd now pass it over to Derek. Uh, he can introduce uh, himself, and then uh, we can go into the fireside chat from there. Thank you. Okay, well, I have a, a um, I guess a short presentation that I'm, I'm going to share with everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. If you just bear with me just one second. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I, I wanted to talk about uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, uh, thank you for, for having me here to, to speak. Um, uh, and this is, I'm going to whip through these pretty quickly. Uh, so so just bear with me. Uh, this is really more a, a, a talk about um, on, on the entrepreneurial spirit, and we really have to start with it being um, the you know a, the the startup is is actually uh, you. So um, uh, that's that's really uh, where where it, it starts. Um, so um, uh, going on, uh, this is my my CV. Um, I've done. I started off doing many years of, of investment banking and then uh, consulting, uh, so on and so forth. But I'm most proud of the fact that I've, I've had the opportunity to evaluate over 15,000 pitches and business plans. Uh, sounds like a lot, but if you do 20 business plans a week for 15 years, you'll get the same number. Uh, I also um, have been going in and out of Shenzhen since the, since the mid 90s. So I've been doing that a long time. Uh, uh, and of course, that's sort of grown into the, the Greater Bay uh, area, Greater Bay region. Uh, I used to work at a larger fund and uh, had uh, some very big investors, uh, such as the uh, Hong Kong government, Singapore GIC, uh, Doko Fujitsu, Mitsui Sun Microsystems, Doko, and um, uh, at that time, Hong Kong Telecom, Cable and Wireless, which is now BCCW. Uh, I think for, for those of you as, as entrepreneurs, you know that this is kind of how life really is in terms of, of the ups and downs that you go through. Uh, and um, uh, as, as an entrepreneur, you know that it, you don't really have to be working in an office. This is kind of the reality of, of, of what we do is, is uh, you're, you're really doing your job 24-7. Um, so so I, I set up my fund in... Um, in, uh, in, in 2004, uh, called Break Soldier Venture Capital. And uh, we are, are early technology investors. There's a difference between early stage investors and early technology investors. Uh, early technology investors, they, they actually are 
getting into technologies when they're very new, as opposed to um, uh, uh, focusing on how how early stage the company actually is. So um, when it comes to defining ourselves, if you talk to most investors, they'll have sort of these very broad, uh, very generic uh, titles uh, or categories um, that you see here. Um, I try to stay away from these type of, of, of buzzword, buzzwords because uh, technology is so fast moving, so fast evolving, uh, it's not really right to say you invest in fintech because fintech, if you, it also highlights how much your experience level is. So if an investor says they invest in fintech, to me that means they have about eight years of experience doing it. If they're doing uh, um, cryptocurrency, they have maybe three or four years of experience in it. And if they're doing AI, they're reading about it now and they don't really know that much more than the person they're sitting next to. So, so I, I try to stay away from this because uh, technology is, is too fast evolving and these are really more just flavors of the month. Uh, if we look at how the evolution of mobile, that's the evolution, uh, the evolution of, of, uh, of our networks. Uh, we're going towards 5G, that's another evolution. Bluetooth, same thing. Uh, data storage, same thing. Uh, so you can see there's just so many examples of, of, um, of what that evolution is. So it, it's really not, I think, is, is a great way is, is to, to really kind of talk about um, what areas you're, you're looking at. Even, even when it comes to media, how you consume media, that also changes. So for me, uh, my investment theme is anything that enhances the end user experience. So it's much more broad. It's much more uh, um, about... Um, uh, the more pain points that you take away uh, from doing something, uh, the end user, not the consumer, but the end user will be more inclined to use it. And if you have uh, higher usage, then that obviously will help your business or increase the number of transactions, the number of touch points that you have with your, your customer or your end user. So, so uh, it's more about enhancing the end user experience. Why? Because we live in a sharing economy, as, as we all know. And if we go back to how things were done in the past, uh, back in the 90s, uh, coffee was sold this way, where it's, it's about um, uh, the, the performance of the ingredient caffeine. But uh, today, this is how coffee is. It's experience driven. Uh, same thing um, uh, with Luckin coffee. I, we all know that um, what, what's happened with Luckin today, but that's not my focus of, of of why I'm using this example, but the, the, the coffee experience has changed again. Uh, PC, same thing. It used to have a sticker slapped on the side that said Intel inside. That's also changed. Today, uh, uh, computers are sold this way. Same with grocery shopping. Uh, it's sold this way now. Movie theaters, now it's this, now it's this. So this evolution is, is very fast changing. How about when it comes to uh, customer service? That's also changed. Uh, now we're, we're looking at robots possibly doing a, a consumer experience as well. Um, I'm on the, um, I, I'm an advisor to Hanson Robotics, so um, I, I know that this is a very interesting area that they're looking into. Um, how about taking medicine? Um, actually, taking pills is actually a very inefficient way of getting uh, medicine into your body. Uh, today, it's all about uh, vaping and, and how um, getting uh, inhalation of medicine is actually a much more effective way of getting medicine to the body than, than pills. Uh, so a lot of my experience goes back to the late 90s, uh, specifically to uh, Shenzhen, uh, Dongguan and Guangzhou uh, for uh, specific things uh, that are in the electronics sector. It's not my choice of focus. It just makes sense because the capital is, is uh, for investors is based out here in Hong Kong and Shenzhen is just across the border. Uh, so all the, all the products you see here, I, I've had experience in um, on the manufacturing side and today, Made in Shenzhen is not the same thing as made in China. Uh, the, the quality and output that Shenzhen can produce uh, is, is on a whole different scale than uh, other areas of China where things are, are manufactured. And you can see here a comparison of what that development looks like between the 90s and, and, and 2013 in terms of, of, um, of the lights and the development that's going on. Shenzhen, same thing. Look at the development there. Dongguan is another one. Uh, so a lot of my experiences are really based on the sharing that I do is really based on real life experiences. Uh, I'm not so much focused on trying to share with you academics because you can go learn about that yourself. 
so um, uh, the stories that I tell are all all based on on things that I've actually uh, done in, in in my in my past. Um, 2005 to 2009, invested and exited mobile payments. Uh, of course, everybody talks about mobile payments today, but I think that's that's uh, 2005 technology. So what Apple does today, to me, that's old news. Uh, mobile transactions is a much much bigger uh, thing to focus on than just mobile payments. Uh, as early technology investors, uh, in 2005, we invested in, in robotics and a very early stage AI company, uh, which, which this uh, company was, uh, was, was built on. Um, uh, and in 2005, nobody was talking about AI. Um, and not many people were looking at uh, robotics as well. Uh, this guy is actually the founder of, of, um, of the company, uh, uh, Ugobi. Uh, he's, he, uh, you won't recognize his, his face, but he's the guy who invented the Furby, one of the best selling toys of all time, sold over 40 million, 40 million units worldwide, uh, and it got a lot of publicity. Uh, so um, uh, this is what I mean by being a early technology investor, as opposed to being a early stage investor. Uh, so it's all about sharing the journey and not just the destination. Uh, this picture here is actually a guy vaping, um, which uh, in 20, I think it was 2015, when everybody was looking at FinTech in 2015, which was a very crowded space, I wanted to look for interesting areas where nobody was looking. So I decided vaping was the place to go. Uh, and in 2015, no one knew what it was. Of course, everybody today, uh, seize the opportunity, but uh, way back in, in 2015, five years ago, I had already identified this as a opportunity, and not so much um, in the nicotine space, and I'll show you what, what was attractive to me about this in the ensuing slides. So here, um, within, um, uh, during that time, five years ago, uh, we raised one and a half million from 15 investors, over 20 pitches at Starbucks. Um, so um, uh, that, that I thought was, was a, a very interesting thing to do was to kind of create that story, uh, create the suspense. It's, it's always important to be a good storyteller and, and it's not so much about the presentation. Uh, we commercially launched in 2016. Today, factory visits are awesome. We go there, we walk the production line um, and then going in social media and just seeing how many stores you're in uh, and, uh, and on Instagram, seeing that you're in all the 7-Elevens uh, going across the US. Um, and then turning on the TV and seeing that you have a, a TV infomercial on selling the same product. And that all sounds great, but what if I told you that wasn't the best thing? What, is, what, what industry is actually bigger than tobacco? In, uh, tobacco, of course, is sold all over the world. There's not one country that does not sell cigarettes. Uh, but um, it addresses, out of a 7 billion person population, it only addresses a billion people. But what's bigger than that is actually pharma. Because why? Because everybody on the planet needs medicine. So uh, this is actually what, what I thought was interesting was not so much about the nicotine, but it was more about the device being a medicine delivery system. And once you get that into your head, uh, then it all becomes very clear. Is once you separate the flavor mechanism from the delivery mechanism, now the possibilities are, are endless. So uh, putting that aside, Going back to being a startup, uh, being a startup and focusing on yourself, it's about being here in the now. So uh, for me, outside of work, um, I've written a couple of books. Um, I'm on the boards of, of different companies like Jumpstart and um, SPCA and Junior Achievement. So my passions are startups, animal welfare, and youth education. I'm also an advisor to the uh, Open University of Hong Kong and advisor to Handsome Robotics. And uh, in my free time, I like to run. I run a lot, uh, like, like Forrest Gump. So all those blue dots you see at the bottom left um, are countries that I've gone running in. And when I mean running, it means um, that I run multi-day ultra marathons. Um, I also like to cook, and I've done a TEDx talk. You can go on YouTube and, and find that. Um, but uh, my home is Hong Kong. I grew up here. Uh, there's me um, as a kid uh, going to school. Um, but safe will never get you to awesome. So for me, it was always about pushing the envelope, trying to do something bigger than what I used to do. Uh, so I started running across deserts. This is the Sahara Desert in Egypt, um, jumping out airplanes, rock climbing, hiking, climbing mountains, scuba diving, running marathons. Uh, now I do jujitsu, uh, which is a, 
always fun and it, it's a very challenging uh, because um, uh, trying to choke somebody is actually not that easy because they're not going to let you choke them. So um, that that's uh, it's been a fun thing for me to to do. Um, and then um, uh, you know my passion is running, and a lot of people will say like, well, what's the point of of, of running? You know, and it, you know it's it's doing something that people don't, other people don't understand. And it's a lot like a startup, right? You have some sort of technology product you want to get out into the market, and people don't understand why it's going to be disruptive or, or, or what the purpose of it is. Uh, but you have to stay on and do it. So I became the first Chinese person in the world to run across the highest, driest, hottest, and coldest deserts. Um, so the top left is Antarctica. Um, top right is the Gobi Desert in China, which is the highest altitude. Um, the bottom left is, is the Sahara Desert in Egypt, which is the hottest. And the driest is the Atacama Desert in Chile. And these are seven days, 250 kilometers, carrying a backpack with all your food and equipment, and you just run a marathon every day. So in 2015, I had planned to go to Jordan to, to run there. Um, so I started my training. Uh, I did all my social media sharing of, of running uh, around Hong Kong. Um, Bangkok Marathon was a training marathon for me, so I went and ran that. Hong Kong Marathon was another uh, training marathon. And then uh, we got the notice that um, uh, the race was actually canceled. Um, and that was because of, of all the terrorism that was going on. They burned the Jordanian Air Force pilot back then. So obviously a very dangerous place to go. So I had a plan B, which was a pivot. So a lot like startups, you have to pivot and find something else. So with all that training under my belt, I went to Sri Lanka to, do, to go do my run. And it's like a lot like writing a business plan. You know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So, so that business plan had a problem. My third marathon was to go to Tokyo as my last training marathon. And I ran that, uh, but along, along the run, I fell and I tripped and I tore my hamstring. I didn't know how bad I tore it, but I knew I had to finish. So um, the cutoff time for the marathon was six hours. I crossed the finish line in five hours and 58 minutes, uh, but I finished. Uh, but when I came back to Hong Kong, uh, my hamstring was, was torn and that's all of the hem internal hemorrhaging and bleeding. And I went, went to my doctor and my doctor said, yeah, you, you, you've got two months. And I'm like, two months for what? Is it two months for that to heal? Because you can't sew it back together. It's a torn muscle. It just it has to heal on, a, on its own. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I was supposed to go to Jordan. That got canceled. Now I'm going to Sri Lanka. I can't not, I can't not do this because I've invested too much training time into this. And the doctor said, well, pain will make you stop. I can't keep you, not keep you from going. So um, just promise me uh, before you actually go to Sri Lanka, don't do anything. So I had 12 days to get better. And 12 days is impossible because you need two months. So here you can see me on the, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. 12 days later, I lined up. Everybody's starting to run, and I'm standing there because I hadn't done any, any exercise. I was very scared about, about making it worse, but I knew I had to finish. So I had good days, hard days, so-so days, um, and I had really bad days where I just had to walk. And these were days when I, I just thought, like, there's just no way I can finish this. And hope and prayers are not really my thing, so I just had to keep going. Um, and the last day was 1,870 steps at the top of this, this, uh, this rock, um, 16 kilometers. And, uh, there's me across the finish line because, um, uh, you know, life, life never gives you a moment of your choosing. You just have to be hundred percent ready for anything. So, so that's a lot like the way, uh, you are as a startup. So these days I, I spend a lot of time sharing my experiences with, with people, with schools, uh, with, with companies, uh, inspiring them, motivating them. Uh, a TEDx talk, I'm very proud of that. Uh, my books, um, I write books and I donate the money that's generated to charity. Um, I do fundraising uh, for the SPCA. Uh, I go to schools and I, I, I talk about my book. Um, and writing the book was actually a startup in itself. Uh, just taking childhood books that I liked, uh, putting that together um, in a storybook type of format, and from, from, from a white sheet of paper, blank sheet of paper, uh, to store shelves, eight months. That's how long it took me to, to get uh, this uh, to be commercial. So if you really want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. You just have to set up a timeline and follow it. Uh, so uh, now I get to go to kids' schools, and I, I do my talks, which is great. Um, cooking, I've never had a cooking lesson in my life, but it's a great way to meet people. And uh, repetition is the mother of all skill. So for me, it's just about repeating things over and over again until you get it right. So now I can cook like this um, without even taking a cooking lesson. 
Um, just practice makes perfect. And uh, if you don't run it, if you don't run across deserts with me, no problem. Then I'll cook you desserts. So that's the way I look at it. Uh, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Um, I tore my Achilles. Um, and uh, a lot of people said, well, what desert did you do to, to, to damage yourself like that? And it actually became a dodgeball. Um, I had surgical reattachment. I had to go through all this physiotherapy. I wore a boot. I had a cast on. Um, but it, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. So right after I healed, after I got my cast off, um, I went around the Macau Marathon. It wasn't pretty, but I finished. And then eight weeks later, I ran the Hong Kong Marathon, finished that. And everybody told me, he's like, oh, but running across deserts, the thing that you really like to do, um, that's your passion. How are you going to do that? And I said, well, that's a good question. If you, if you don't try, you'll never know. Um, and they were saying, well, maybe you should, stick, you, should, you should try picking up golf. And I refused to do that. And I just wanted to stick to my guns and stay focused on getting back to running marathons ultra marathons. So 13 weeks later, I went to Namibia and I ran 250 kilometers in seven days. Today, my, my doctor is so proud of me. He put me in the hospital brochure. So times have changed. Forget about waiting for normal to return. This is the new normal. So COVID-19, this is going to be the new normal because after this is done, there's going to be another one and another one after that. So um, uh, your health uh, and the way we do business today is it's going to fundamentally change everything that we do. Uh, so um, don't give up. You, 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 you have to fail a lot in order to succeed because failure is where you learn. Um, and uh, the other thing is about commitment. You have to stay committed to what you're doing. Um, your comfort zone is here. That's, that's great because uh, that's where things are predictable. That's where uh, uh, it's safe and routine, but that's where the magic happens is on the outside of that. So people like to ask me, it's like, well, how do you train? And I, I run with a backpack of rice. You have to get comfortable with uncomfortable. So what you see here is all the pain and misery. What I see here is a learning experience. Each, each time I go out and run, I learn from that. So um, you have to carry all your equipment in a backpack um, and you train. And we've been doing this uh, for ages, whether you're training for the military, training for sports, uh, MMA fighting, we've been doing this uh, in, throughout our history. Um, so for me, I train with sacks of rice and I run around Hong Kong on the trails. Um, I run at the beach, I run on the treadmill, I run on the roads. Um, and it's just about getting used to that type of misery and, um, the treadmill's broken, push the treadmill. I run, a, I, I run around, uh, with a training mask on because it's harder. So people say, well, what's the purpose of all that? What you see at the bottom there is just ultra marathons. But what I see is networking, be able to be, have stories to tell. The media takes an interest. I write books. I have all these different things that, I, that are basically a platform that I can build upon. And then from that, I build things on top of that. And then from that, there's brands that I get to work with, opportunities that I would have got, been able to do, which I never would have had, uh, been able to do before had I not done the very bottom thing, which is start running. So um, give what you have. You know, Sharing that uh, experience with someone you could really help somebody by doing that. It's, it, I think um, you know, living in Hong Kong, everything is about taking and, and about me, me, me. But I think that you know, we're, we're, it, we're in a time where we have to share our experiences. And, and um, you know, anyone can get to Everest Base Camp. That's basically um, uh, what a startup is, is, is getting that first round of funding. And everybody's all happy about that. But the reality is, is like, don't forget, you still got to climb to the top of the mountain. So just because you get that first round of funding, uh, doesn't mean that you stop there. It means that you, you have to, to keep going. So um, we're coming up towards the end of my presentation, but I just wanted to leave you with, with a very important message is, is don't focus on building, um, uh, don't focus on, on, on building a startup. You want to focus on building a business. And the main, the, the main difference between the two is that one ton noodle shop that you go to across the street for lunch every day, that guy's an entrepreneur too. The main difference is that he's focused on building a business. He knows that he has to sell 20 bowls, 50 bowls of noodles at lunch and another 50 bowls at dinner. And uh, if, you sit, if you sit there after you finish your noodles and you're just playing with your phone, he's going to kick you out, right? He's just focused on building a business. Uh, so it's not all the startup nonsense um, that, that uh, sometimes you can get um, distracted by. Uh, you have to just really focus on building a business. And if you wake up every morning, thinking in that mindset, instead of building a startup, uh, you'll find that the dynamics are very different. So hustle 
is the most important word ever. You really have to focus on, on um, getting your business going uh, by hustling. Because no one is going to do it for you. It's, it's just you. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, sorry if I spoke too quickly, but I'm trying to cram a lot of information in um, uh, in a very short period of time. Thank you. Thanks, Terry, so much for sharing. Uh, it was really good to hear about your motivation, especially, at, I guess, during this difficult time and how you overcame things uh, even when you're injured. I think and applying that back to startups. So very, very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, there's some questions already. Um, so instead of me asking the questions this time, uh, let me just submit some of the questions to you, uh, Terry. Sure. So we have one from uh, Richard, uh, Richard Yop. He goes, what are the success factors uh, when you're looking at the startup and its founder? Sorry, can you repeat that? He goes, uh, what are the success factors when you're looking at the startup and its founder? I guess uh, characteristics and uh, of the founder and their startup. So for, so for me, the, 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 the idea is, is not so much as, as important as, as the, the founder's experience. Uh, that, that I think is, for me, is more important than, than the, the product or the service itself because um, it all comes down to execution capability. Uh, so you're really looking for those character traits that will lead towards uh, the right execution of the business. So you can have a fantastic idea uh, and a very mediocre management team, and they'll, they can run that business into the ground. But if you have a, a mediocre idea, but a really good team, they'll take that business to some level of, of success. So uh, investing in companies, it's, it's not so much the idea, it's a more about the psychology of the founders and the management team. So you're, it's really more of, of, a, of a psychological lead of the person looking at, at how they communicate, um, uh, the words, the choice of words that they use when they speak to you, uh, and what their ambitions are, uh, what drives them, what motivates them. Those are, those are all uh, very important because a bit, I've, never, I've never heard a pitch or read a business plan that did not tell me what I did not want to hear. So it's always about this is going to be a fantastic business, and and the you know the market is going to go like this, and we're going to be on this trajectory too. They all tell you the same thing. So you you always have to look at the people behind the business plan. Right, that's very good advice. If there's some characteristics of uh, those people behind the business plan, what would the top traits be? Uh, I like aggression. Uh, I like the drive. I like people being annoying uh, because um, a lot of times when they when they uh, uh, come to you for uh, uh, just to hear their pitch, um, a no doesn't mean a no forever. A no just means at this point in time, the pitch that you've done isn't enough for me to make a decision. Uh, and those who are persistent, those who keep coming back to you with updates, having a coffee. Um, I just want to tell you from when we spoke two months ago, this is what we've done. This is the progress we've made. That builds familiarity. That builds the bond between you and the investor. Uh, that's really important. I think a lot of startups don't understand that, that um, uh, it's, it's all about relationship building. And relationship building doesn't happen in the first meeting. It happens uh, on an ongoing basis. So if you look at um, uh, the business plan is really just more of an academic exercise. Uh, it's really easy to write one. You just, uh, and there's, there's, you can find that on the internet on how to write a business plan. Um, but building a relationship, that's a skill, that's an art, uh, that it requires repetition. So it's about building familiarity and building trust with the other person. So it's about having coffee today and another one next month and another one a couple months after that, uh, just to build up the familiarity because that, that's uh, equally uh, important. Uh, so that when it comes time to, for an investment, it's almost like, um, like, uh, like a game board, right? You roll the dice and you move your piece along the game board. I've never heard a business plan um, in the first pitch and uh, immediately after the pitch, um, I've, I've never seen for myself or another investor get out their checkbook and, and write uh, a check uh, to fund the company. That's never happened. It always happens as you move your game piece along the game board. Um, and that, so a business plan is really more about, not, it's not about getting funding. A business plan is about 
getting to the next need. And if you keep moving your, your game piece along the game board, you'll eventually get to, uh, to an investment. Right, thank you. That was really, really good answer. I like the real world knowledge you bring, uh, Derek. Uh, just a question, uh, I think a follow-up question here is, um, from the context of a startup founder, how do you maintain your motivation and ability to change and adapt? Uh, is it the education, is it family, or adversity and or education and study? I think it's more about just um, adversity. I mean, when you, when you do a startup, uh, it's not about, you don't think about the success and what you see on TV and, 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 and um, uh, all of the, the famous startups that are now really big and look at, at how, 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 uh, how, how um, what's the word I'm looking for? How, uh, how powerful uh, they are today. Um, and how much influence they have on the industry today. Uh, because for me, it, being in a startup means just, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted something easy, go get a regular job. Uh, you get a paycheck every month uh, and uh, uh, life is predictable. If you want to be a founder um, and an entrepreneur, it's about uh, having that persistence because uh, having persistence through adversity, that's something that investors, that's something that people within the community your peers, uh, the people that work with you, the work people that work for you, um, other people uh, throughout your ecosystem, when they see that perseverance and that adversity, they know that startups are all about ups and downs. And it's the, it's the people that don't give up. Those are the ones that you want to invest in, right? Um, the last thing you want to hear as an investor is, well, I burned through your cash. Um, we tried it. It didn't work. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on and go back to my regular job or I'm going to go do another startup. Um, that's, that's not, that's not what being an entrepreneur is. Um, and it's also a huge letdown to your co-founders as well. Uh, because, um, uh, let's say if two or three co-founders start up a business together, um, they're, you know, they split up the work evenly amongst each other. So if there's three co-founders that are each doing 33% of the workload and you get the funding in and they've all made a commitment to be there, they've all quit their job, set aside, uh, certain finances to cover them throughout the period. And the last thing you want to do is be a quitter and leave. And then you leave the work to the other two co-founders because it's not just the workload, but it's also um, the, the morale that you're taking away from, from them as well. And now you've got two people juggling three person's jobs, and that's also a challenge. And then when the next person leaves, you've got one person juggling everything, um, and that, that's not good. And it's just a downward spiral, right? So... Um, it's, it's, it, you have to think about your community. Um, you can't selfishly think about you. It's, it's, it's about, um, if you make a commitment to do, do a business, you need to have staying power. And staying power is, is, is about your, your perseverance for adversity. So no matter how hard things get, you're going to be standing right next to your co-founders. Right. That's true. I think that's an interesting question, an interesting answer, because... Um, I'm sure right now there'll be a lot of startup founders who are experiencing those issues, um, especially during this COVID-19. Um, so yeah, that's that's good helpful advice. Um, just wanted to have a more personal question here from Stephanie. Uh, she goes, out of all your ultra marathons, uh, which was your favorite experience and why? Um, I have a couple of favorites. Um, the one, uh, that I enjoyed the most was Iceland. Uh, Iceland was uh, just an amazing place uh, to, to be there. Um, uh, it's just so surreal uh, to, to be in a country like that with the Northern Lights and, and um, uh, just see, you know, a lot of movies are actually filmed there, right? Um, uh, I think Game of Thrones and, and other, other types of movies um, that need that type of environment that doesn't even look like you're on planet earth, that's, that's Iceland. Um, so that, that was a uh, really an amazing place to be. And Namibia was also great, uh, um, to, to actually literally be running across sand dunes and going up one sand dune and the next and then up the next one and down the next and standing on top of the sand dune and just looking across and you see a whole sea of sand dunes. They actually call, um, that area of Namibia, the skeleton coast. And the reason why is because, um, uh, during, uh, it's one of the few deserts that actually end in the ocean. So um, uh, you keep the visual cues of, of, of um, being at the beach is the sun and the sand and the ocean. 
the visual cues of, of being uh, in the desert in Namibia is exactly the same thing. So you, you have, you're running up and down these sand dunes on the very last one, you stand on top and you look down and you see the waves hitting the sand dune. And it's a very steep beach. It's, it's really neat. And along the way, when you're running through that desert, you'll see ships uh, right in the middle of the desert because when the tide was high, they came in. And then um, uh, when the tide went out, the ships got stuck there. So um, that's why they called the Skeleton Coast. And, and Namibia was, was another fantastic place to be. Great. In terms of, um, uh, let me bring it back to startups now. Um, in terms of uh, having an idea uh, and having that idea come too soon uh, versus technology that's not out there yet and having some traction before everyone else gets in, um, what do you think a startup founder should do? Wait for the idea to be more mature or get in uh, early whilst there's no one there? Um, I think you just, it, it's, um, you can do either. Uh, if we take an example of like, let's say Facebook, they were late to the market. Uh, they just did it better than everybody else. So just because the market's really crowded doesn't mean you should, you should not do it. It just means you have to do it better than everybody else. Uh, so, uh, uh, but if it wasn't for um, uh, MySpace, if it wasn't for Friendster that uh, sort of trained us uh, to be familiar with, with uh, social networking, uh, Facebook wouldn't be where it is today. Uh, so, um, getting, getting in early on into a technology that no one's in right now, nothing wrong with that. Definitely be a first mover, um, uh, be that disruptor. Um, but at the same time, if it's a, a very, uh, competitive business, uh, you just have to do something better. So another example is, is let's say running shoes. Um, uh, there's a company called Hoka, H-O-K-A. Hoka, late entrance to the market. Uh, they came on, they came around. I think maybe six or seven years ago. Um, no one knew what they were. Ugly shoes in the world. They look like clown shoes. Um, I was sponsored by Solomon. Great trail running shoes. Of course, Adidas and Nike are long, long established brands. Um, and, and along comes this, this late player in the market. And now they're one of the top running brands um, in the world. And they got acquired by Skechers. So um, uh, to be acquired this late in the game, they must have been doing something right. So um, uh, don't be intimidated just because the market is competitive. Um, just do it, but do it better than everybody else. Right. And if you, if you have one of those startups that uh, are being founded on one of these very early stage, idea, uh, early technology ideas, would you say it's better to be in a place where there's more support from the government? Or would you say it's better to hustle and just get out there? I like hustling uh, because hustling gives you so many more opportunities um, and it's so dynamic. Uh, whereas if you're uh, more dependent on government support, the government support will only take you so far. There has not been any type of government funding or support um, that will take you all the way to the finish line. Uh, so, um, uh, so it's great to have it, uh, but I would say that if you really want to be a mover and shaker, you have to be dynamic, you have to think outside the box, you have to go to every single meeting, you have to meet different people from all walks of life. And just because you think someone in a, in a networking event is not interesting, that person may not be interesting, but you don't know who that person knows. And that person isn't going to share their Rolodex with you in a first meeting. It's gonna to have to take another coffee, another meetup after that, uh, building that, again, building that familiarity, building that, that relationship, building the reputation with that person before they, they, they actually understand what you really do for your business and what your company really does, what product you do, what service you sell. And only then can they think about, oh, I can actually help you. Or let me introduce you to this person or that person. But no one in the beginning uh, um, in a networking event that you meet in the first 10 minutes is going to offer up any of that because uh they just don't know you, right? So you have to build up the trust. You have to build a relationship first before you can actually uh, uh, go on and, and see if that person can help you in your, in your business or whatever it is that you need to do. Right. And, and if there's a, like two different types of co-founders, one's more technical and the other one's more, I guess, social, would you say that one is more likely to succeed than the other or they both have their own? 
Well, I, I see there, there's, there's uh, two different types of co-founders. Uh, one is more business focused. One has the business skills and the other one is more of a, a techie. Um, uh, ideally, as an investor, you would like to have someone who, who's 50-50, who has equal. But the, the reality in life is they're, they're really, it's, it's very hard to find uh, uh, founders like that. So usually it's, um, it's, a, it's a, uh, a founder who's, who's more skewed on one side towards the other, um, which means that um, as a single founder, um, I find that they're harder uh, to invest in because they're usually skewed towards one side. But more importantly, that a single founder um, has no one to, to talk to because their employees are employees, your advisors are your advisors, investors are investors, uh, but they're not uh, on the same level as you. So you do need a co-founder and a co-founder has to be complementary. Uh, you can't have two co-founders that are equally techies because then no one's bringing in any business. And on the flip side is if you have two co-founders that are um, uh, more sales focused, then you don't have one uh, manning, manning the fort holding down the office so so um it's very important that that they they um uh have um uh have a uh complementary skill sets if it's a single per founder who would be better um a techie or someone who's who's more uh business focused um i equate business focus as as a um as someone with with sales salesmanship and salesmanship as a life skill is probably the most important thing uh, people can have. So um, I, I would prefer to invest in someone who has salesmanship than, than, um, than a techie because salesmanship, you're doing that your whole life. You're always convincing someone of something, whether it's where are we going for lunch? Maybe Benson wants to have Japanese food and I want to have Indian food. Well, you know, we have to try to convince each other and see who wins that argument, right? Um, and it's the same thing if you're talking to an investor, right? You, you have to create, um, the story, have that salesmanship, have that persistence. Uh, you can you can be a great techie, but if you can't sell your product, it's going to be really tough. Yeah, that's true. Actually, uh, a follow-up question here is uh, more from the investor angle, which I also found interesting. Um, so, Richard is asking from an investor perspective, how actively do you get involved with the management team to build the business? Um, he has so some where? I'm going to start with that one here. Yeah, so so um, uh, I think as as an early stage investor, as an early technology investor, anybody who professes to be in this segment of funding, um, the biggest um, uh, irresponsibility uh, an investor can have is to invest in a startup and sit at a board level, uh, because um, again, I go back to my example about repetition. Is the only way you're going to learn about a business is by rolling up your sleeves and doing it every day. So um, sitting at a board level and reading management reports, that's not gonna get you there. You have to be at the factory, on the production line, in meetings, at the office with, with the employees, and that's how you learn about a business, is to be there every day. So uh, being hands-on, whereas a lot of investors say they are, I think the reality in life is they're not. Uh, uh, but uh, um, the type of investors uh, that you should seriously look at are ones that um, are actually very hands-on and they are um, at the office every day like, like an employee is because that's where they learn. That's where they see the, the energy and the dynamic, the communication dynamics between uh, uh, people on the team. And uh, at that point in time, they can help to be a problem solver, whereas at a board level, it's firefighting. And no one ever wants to be in a firefighting situation because um, it's just total chaos. And that's what we saw back in year 2000 during the dot-com bust. It was, it was all chaos. There wasn't any problem solving because all these investors just sat on boards. Right. So what happens um, when the core management team falls apart after your investment? What should you do as an investor? Should you inject a new management team or recover investment or what should an investor do at that point? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, there, if, there are, um, if the management team isn't working, they have to be uh, replaced. And a lot of the agreements, investor agreements that are, that are, um, um, that are, are set up um, for the investor to come in, 
they all will address that situation, right? So if there's a lack of performance, uh, those, uh, uh, those people that are not um, are contributing uh, to the company will be uh, very quickly replaced uh, because the company has to continue to move on. Everything that, that is being done is for the benefit of the company. Right, for sure. So um, in terms of um, uh, having that investor mindset and being able to um, find the startup, um, what, what should a uh, investor do to match uh, his skills and the startup? Is there something that they should be doing or is there something that they should expect the startups to do? Uh, I, I don't understand the question. Uh, so um, let's say you have an investor who's looking at a startup. Uh, would they be uh, having having their own skill sets that they should match back to the startup, or they just find an idea and they think, "Hey, that's great. Let me go in based on the idea." So, well, um, you're 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 saying that uh, if if a uh, what kind of value can the investor add uh, to to the startup? It well, I mean, every all the all investors you have to look at their background and see what, uh, what are they particularly good at because um, uh, that will give you some uh, visibility as to what they can actually do. Um, uh, and most investors that you, you, you see will come from some sort of finance background. So obviously they're probably pretty good with numbers. They're pretty good at, at writing a pitch deck um, and helping you in that regard. Uh, but if you need someone who uh, can help you with manufacturing, then you should really look for someone who has a manufacturing background or someone on the team, um, that on the investment team that has uh, a manufacturing background um, or connections to customers. Uh, there, you have to look at their skill set. So for me, I talk a lot about um, having a lot of Chinese experience, uh, particularly when it comes to manufacturing, specifically in Shenzhen, uh, uh, specifically in consumer electronics. Uh, so um, you'll know. From, from, from my side that that is my experience. But I started off in banking, so um, I can write a business plan as well. I, I, can, uh, I can crunch numbers. I, I have that uh, skill set as well. Uh, so, um, and then because I do a lot of talks, um, which you can find online, um, I think I'm a good communicator as, as well. So, so you kind of have to see what are the skill sets that are required to make your business successful and if that investor comes on board, can they, do they have those elements to help you? Right. That's good. Let, let me bring it back to a startup question here. Now, what are some common mistakes you have seen co-founders make while launching a startup or, or launching a product? Um, the most common one that I've seen is that uh, um, co-founders or, or founders or entrepreneurs, they very naturally have a... Um, a, um, uh, they're very uh, strong-minded, uh, so uh, they're very stubborn. Um, that can be viewed as a good trait or a bad trait. Uh, you look at it as a, as a good trait because um, they know what the market needs or they're, they're very focused on what their beliefs are, and that persistence is, is uh, very much welcome. But at the same time, um, that persistence going in the wrong direction is also uh, not good as well. So if the company is going in the wrong direction and, and the performance of the company is being impacted by that, then that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, the other thing, uh, too, um, is that um, uh, sometimes investors can also be perfectionists. And perfectionists, again, it's a trait that's very good, and it's also a, uh, a trait that can be very bad. Um, uh, it's bad in a sense where the, the uh, entrepreneur wants to finish their product, but it has to be perfect. And we all know what MVP means. So it's like, I don't care. Just get the product out the door. Let's just get some sales in. You can perfect the, the pr product along the way, but we can't wait another six months. So we're going to burn through the cash. Uh, we need to go back to investors. Uh, in six months time, it'll be the end of the year. Everybody's on holiday. And then it's Christmas, New Year's, Chinese New Year. No one's going to be around. We, we can't afford to be in that predicament. So we need to start selling the product now. Um, you don't get your product out by uh, September. Um, when, when retailers place their orders, um, you're not going to have anything on, on, um, on store shelves by Christmas, right? You have to kind of work that timeline backwards to see if they don't deliver on this particular day, this particular month, how is that going to impact? What is the chain reaction going to be? 
can you survive that chain reaction? So it's a lot like COVID-19. It's like no one knows where this is going. Uh, we just know that it's just going to go on and on and on and on. So do you have the monthly cash flow to sustain the new normal, right? Um, uh, your customers aren't buying your product anymore. They can't even get out of their house. So uh, how are you going to continue your business? Good luck talking to investors because a lot of investors, they, if they don't see the finish line, it's very hard for them to make a decision to invest. So you need to have a plan B, you know, set aside your cash, slow down your burn rate, and just make sure that every month you're able to pay your, your monthly bills. Right. Speaking of COVID-19, um, you, you know, you, you being someone that goes through a lot of ultra marathons is resilient and being able to overcome those challenges. What do you think is something that a startup should focus on to be resilient and overcome COVID-19 in the new normal now? John, are you talking about from a, um, like a, like a, a theme perspective, like an investment theme? I, I think it's more from a business perspective how the startups, let's say they've already got a monthly recurring revenue, um, but what should they be focused on in this time to survive and grow? So um, how you should handle your, your company, how you should manage your company during this time is, 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 uh, is the same thing as what investors are doing, which is you know, no one knows how things are gonna pan out. We don't know if there's gonna be a resurgence. We don't know if the infection rate is going to come back, if there's going to be a, a third wave or a fourth wave or a fifth wave. No one knows. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen this coming winter. Winter is just a few months away. So um, uh, with that in mind, um, there's really nothing um, historically at this scale, at a global scale, which uh, we can look back on. So um, it's, it's just a, a great big black hole. And the only way you deal with black holes is to, is to uh, uh, make sure that you have enough set aside for a rainy day, but you don't know how, much is, how many rainy days you're gonna have. So you just have to be able to survive. And this is not a time to take chances and be heroic and save the company by developing a new product that you're gonna launch tomorrow. Um, I think it's about being ultra conservative in what you do and just make sure that you, you are, are able to um, think about company first and make sure you pare down your expenses um, and keep the company um, at a minimal expense level to ride out this opportunity. I think that um, this, this, this pandemic, uh, I think that the next nine months is, is, is going to be more or less the same where um, when things have cleared up, uh, governments are going to be extra cautious uh, because there's a lot of, uh, because of the economies involved and they're, they're going to take uh, uh, specific measures to just sort of tailor uh, uh, the things in phases where you're not going to go out and everything's going to return to normal tomorrow. It's going to be a slowly phased approach. And as soon as there's a resurgence, they're going to cut back on it and we're going to just take steps back, go backwards again. So, um, uh, you know, and, and, and trying to go out and talk to investors and, and get, get funding to get you through this, um, I'd say that that's a, not a great situation to do because um for one there's not a lot of not a lot of money out there number one number two is those investors who are who would invest they will probably give you very unfavorable investor terms because they know they can do that because there's just not a lot of money out there so so um, you'll probably get a much lower valuation uh there will probably be a lot of tnc's in there terms and conditions that you won't like but um that's just the way the reality is because because there's uh, a shortage of of money out there um, the investors who are investing are going to ask for a lot of things that you probably won't like. So um, in order to avoid that, you can focus on um, individual funding and funding from in, uh, individuals because they would have a lot less requirements um, and they understand you, they know you personally, so they're more willing to, to take a chance. Uh, but going to institutional funds right now, I think is, is not the right move. And uh, if you're able to set aside uh, uh, the money that you do have and just spread that out over, over the next six to nine months, that's probably a safer bet. Right, that's good advice. Now, there's actually a question um, from one of the startups here, uh, Alvin. He says, assume a startup got a, has got a good business model and has been running for a year. 
they got some traction. What is a good amount to ask for seed funding? Uh, is there a minimum, like uh, US 1 million for 10%? That, that's really hard to answer because um, uh, I have to know what, what kind of business it is because uh, let's say if it's, if it's a consumer electronics and you're manufacturing a product, there's a lot of money that goes into R&D. Um, if it's in, in, let's say, in, uh, if it's in drug development, you know, there's, there's a lot of regulatory issues around that. There's also a lot of uh, money spent that goes into that. So it, it's very hard to say, well, what's, what, how much is, is how much? I mean, like, how long is a piece of string? Uh, so um, I would say that if you're going to the market to raise money, you probably need at least enough to cover 12 months. Uh, so when people raise money, they either need to raise money to cover a specific timeline uh, or they have specific milestones that they want to achieve because you have to assume that uh, whatever amount you're asking for, uh, it needs to achieve a certain milestone in your business plan. And that milestone that is going to be achieved needs to warrant the next round of funding. It needs to justify the next round of funding. So if you need a million US dollars, um, it better get you to a point where after you've spent that million dollars, that milestone that you've achieved, getting a customer, opening up in a new market, having a new product, getting some sort of regulatory license or approval, um, when you raise the next round after that, those investors have to be able to say, yeah, that was well spent. Uh, and um, now you, your company is worth this much more in the valuation. Uh, so we're willing to um, uh, continue to fund or, or a new investor coming in is willing to put more money in at a higher valuation. Because the flip side to that is if you, um, if you, the money that you raise doesn't get you to the next milestone, you weren't able to achieve it, or you achieve the milestone, but investors are like, yeah, that didn't really add any value to your business, then you're looking at a down round. Then you're looking at a lower valuation, and then your existing investors aren't going to be too happy with that. And the new investors are going to take a bigger chunk of your company because now you're at a lower valuation. Right. I just have a, a final question here to wrap things up. I have a question about um, Hong Kong in particular and being a Hong Kong startup. Would you say that there's a natural progression um, for different markets like going into China or uh, going somewhere else um, from Hong Kong? Or would you say it doesn't matter as long as uh, you find the right business to do? Um, it, it depends on where your customers are, uh, for one, uh, who you're selling to. Uh, also, it depends on um, what kind of business you're in. If you're in manufacturing, it kind of makes sense to, um, uh, to be uh, closer to your, your factory. Because uh, in the beginning, when you're in the R&D phase of your, of your business, you do have to make repeated visits to the factory. Once the company's evolved, and moved into the next chapter of its story where the product's already done and now you've evolved from being an R&D company into a boring sales and distribution company, then you probably don't need to go to the factory as much and then you could probably uh, be, be elsewhere, um, set up sales office somewhere else, um, be closer to your customers as opposed to being closer to, to, uh, to the manufacturer. But at the end of the day, um, the number one rule that I, that I think of is that you always have to be closer to your investors. Um, that's super important because if you have a great business and you're in Vietnam, uh, the likelihood that investors from Singapore and Hong Kong are gonna come see you is, is gonna be quite remote. Um, so um, to me, all roads in, to startups all lead back to some kind of funding, whether it's, it's uh, friends and family or through institutional investors, it always goes back to money uh, because um, uh, your pockets are only so deep and at some point, you're going to have to go to um, external sources of funding. So being close to your investors is important. And uh, if you look at that on a more micro level, um, take, for example, in Hong Kong, being out at Hong Kong Science Park or being out at Cyberport, probably not the best place to be because your investors are, are most likely going to be in other parts of the city, uh, like, let's say, in, in, in Central or Shenghuan area. So um, you want to be close to them. Uh, because um, it's just easier to visit, easier to have coffees. And if, you, if you're not closer to them, then um, you, have to, you still have to make repeated visits to come out this way to, to see them. So, so um, uh, I would much rather have a startup 
um, be in a co-working space uh, closer um, uh, to uh, Hong Kong side than it would be for them to have a cheaper space uh, in Cyberport or, or Hong Kong Science Park uh, because you're further away from your investors. And um, uh, if you don't need funding, fine, do, do, do what you need to do, be, be where you wanna be. But if you do need funding, um, you do need to be closer to them because it just makes things more convenient. Right, sure. Any uh, last words of advice, um, Derek? Uh, something that's burning in your mind that you think everyone should pay attention to right now as a startup? Um, uh, I like the new normal. Uh, a lot of uh, corporates, they have this, this belief that, well, we're going to resume X, Y, and Z uh, when things return to normal. Well, the reality is, is, is you know, uh, things, this is the new normal. Right, so you you have to be able to adapt and adjust because as a startup, being flexible and um, and uh, uh, being able to to think outside the box and be resourceful and figure out another way to do something, that's where the reward comes is is to be able to do something and think about uh, opportunities, um, think of, think about a more efficient way of doing things um, than just sitting around waiting for things to return to normal because. Um, things aren't going to be, and you just have to find a new way, a better way of, of, of doing it. Yeah, that's true. Right. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, thanks for spending the time today. Um, and everyone, uh, if you want to see this uh, video, it will be up on YouTube soon. Um, I'll also share it with uh, the other channels as well. Um, thanks again uh, for really spending the time giving that great advice, especially the real-world advice. I think a lot of other investors usually go in the general route, and you were very, very helpful with that specific advice so thanks Derek um, sure yep no worries and catch everyone else uh, in another time um, there'll be another webinar on the 28th of uh, May um, with Joseph Gunn from Viki and on the 11th of June with uh, Steve Melnush from Property Guru so thank you very much uh, and talk to you later thanks Derek bye